Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now, here is Dennis Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this Family Bible Study Hour. Ready to get back into our Father's Word here at the chapel. We're going to pick it up today with Psalm 119. I did want to make one comment uh, that I meant to make in our last lecture. Uh, verse 8 of Psalm 118, uh, according to one of our students in Florida, is the middle verse of the Bible. Now, I'm not talking about pages of Scripture if you actually count the number of verses up to Psalm 118 verse 8 and there are an equal number of verses following Psalm 118 8 when you finish the book of Revelation. Now I didn't bother to count them myself uh, to verify that but in, if any of you care to take that on as a home assignment have at it. You got a lot more time on your hands than I have at this point in time. But uh, interesting to note, Psalm 119, uh, the longest psalm, the longest book, if you will, in God's Word with 176 verses. Uh, we had Psalm 117 uh, in our next to last lecture, the shortest verse in God uh, and uh, psalm in God's Word, or it may have been in our last lecture, I guess it was. But Psalm 117, we had a very short introduction because it's a short psalm. Now, we got a little bit of a lengthy introduction to Psalm 119, but this Psalm 119 is just chock full of meat. If you're willing to put the work into it, to dig it out. I enjoyed preparing it uh, to teach to you, and, and I hope you enjoy uh, learning from Psalm 119. Psalm 119, unique it is an acrostic psalm, and it's divided up into 22 sections. And uh, no surprise, there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. Acrostics most often have to do with the uh, alphabet, now, not the English alphabet. Stay with me. We're talking about the Hebrew alphabet. In fact, it is those of you, those of you with companion Bibles, you have. Uh, the, the Hebrew alphabet on by every line as it appears in Psalm 119. But those of you that don't have a companion Bible, many of you, you have the Hebrew letter at the beginning of each section and then how it's pronounced in, uh, how we would pronounce it, say it in English, to pronounce it in Hebrew, in other words. More on that in a minute. But we have 22 sections. Uh, there are another unique thing about it is you have eight verses or, or lines in the Hebrew, better said, for each section. So therefore, a total of 176 verses. Also interesting to note that Yahweh, uh, the sacred name of our Heavenly Father, is utilized 22 times in Psalm 119, equivalent to uh, the number of sections. If you have a uh, companion Bible, I want you to make a note of Appendix 73. And, and, and what we find is that uh, Bullinger points out, and, and it's called uh, the Ten Words. And another unique thing about Psalm 119 is that in every section, you're going to have the 22 sections, you're going to find in every verse at least one time one of the ten words that Bullinger points out that relate to God's Word, uh, different names for the Ten Commandments, uh, different names for God's Word appear at least one time, with one exception. And that really makes that verse stick out uh, uh, and catches the eye of scholars because it doesn't have that word. That is verse 122. And uh, there's a special, uh, in the Masera, there's a special rubric uh, which makes a note, if you will, uh, concerning verse 122 to the, this effect. Now, I'm just going to read the ten words to you. And again, if you have a companion Bible, make a note of Appendix 73. Uh, a good little side study would be for you to, to check out that appendix. 
the ten words that we find at least one time in each verse with the exception of verse uh, 122 are uh, way and they're either this word or a word that is most often translated as way, testimony, precepts, commandment, saying, law, judgment, righteousness, statutes, and word. And as we began this Deuteronomy book, uh, we learned that, that all blessings uh, concerning uh, the, the, the God's, God's word, all blessings uh, for Israel, the nation, all blessings for man, all blessings for the sanctuary, and all blessings for the nations, uh, the earth, if you will, also can be thrown in there, uh, are bound up in, in living the words of God. And, and this Psalm 119, what we learn is what the word of God is to man and how man is to behave himself in relation to the word of God. Psalm 119, the first section, uh, quickening of the written word. And you know the word is alive. And, and the quickening means to, to make alive. If you have a quickening spirit, it means to make a spirit alive, if you will, as opposed to a spiritually dead uh, spirit. But God's word is alive. And, and that's one of the things that I, I often pray before I go on to do a program here at Shepherd's Chapel is that God will give me the ability to, to bring His Word alive to those who are willing uh, to listen. And a, a gifted teacher of God's Word should be able to make His Word become alive because after all, it is alive. Um, the author of Psalm 119 we're going to see Hezekiah's thumbprint all over Psalm 119. Although uh, he chose to make uh, the, whoever the author, the psalmist is in Psalm 119, he, he chose to remain anonymous. But uh, Psalm 120 through Psalm 134 is a special group of psalms uh, known as the Song of Degrees. And all but, uh, what is it, I think 10 of those uh, all but four or five, in other words, are not uh, written by Hezekiah. So, uh, but as we work our way through Psalm 119, uh, I'll point out as we see Hezekiah's thumbprint. Hezekiah, for if, those of you who don't know, one of the more righteous kings of Judah. Uh, his father, Ahaz, was a rotten king. Uh, he went so far as to close Solomon's temple, the temple, the house of God. Uh, that's how bad things got under his father. One of the first things Hezekiah did was reopen the temple of God, and he also reinstituted the celebration of the Passover. With that introduction, let's ask a word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name, Father. We ask you to open eyes, open ears this day. Let's go with Psalm 119, verse 1 out of 176 verses. Bless, excuse me, blessed are the undefiled, or the sincere, you could translate this, in the way, and this is the first of the ten words. Now, I'm not going to point out every time that one of the ten words is utilized. I am going to point out the first time that each of the ten words of Bullinger's Appendix 73 are utilized in the way, and again, the first of the ten words, who walk in the law, this is the sixth of the ten words, the law of the Lord. Now this word blessed, check it out, is plural, and, and, and it really means, oh, the great happiness uh, are the sincere in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. And I ask, are you blessed? by the word of the Lord, are you happy? Uh, ask yourself, you know, occasionally it's good for us to do a little self-analysis. And if we're not happy, uh, something's wrong because uh, look what all God has done for us. And, and if we live his word and, and our relationship with him is a good one, 
we are blessed and, and you should be happy. If you're not happy, you might want to consider your ways because uh, evidently you've not developed your relationship with your heavenly Father and with His Word. Verse 2, blessed, and again here we have a double beatitude, blessed in verse 1 and again in 2. How happy are they that keep His testimonies and that seek Him with a whole heart. Testimonies is the second of the ten words in Bullinger's Appendix 73 in the Companion Bible. The, dub, the utmost happiness with this double beatitude. Verse 3, they also do no iniquity. They walk in His ways, not their own self-will, but those who are blessed by the Word of God uh, walk in the ways of God. They have their priorities in order, in other words. Others are off walking in the ways of the world. Uh, the ways of the world are more important to them than their relationship with their Heavenly Father. That's the reason that they're not blessed in many cases. That's the reason that they're not happy. Verse 4, Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts, the third in the order of ten words, precepts is diligently. In other words, this is a, a mandate, if you will, from your heavenly Father. The Lord commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. And, to, you know, and nobody's perfect. I don't want anybody getting off on a guilt trip. We all fall short from time to time. We, we get away from his word and we get distracted. It's awfully easy to, to become distracted these days. But for the most part, we try and do what is right. We try and, and, and do the righteous thing, which simply means to do the right thing. Verse 5, Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. And statutes is the ninth in the order of the ten words according to Bullinger's Appendix 73. This word statutes, check it out, the prime of it is to engrave. In other words, this is so important that you can engrave it in stone, if you will. And you know, the Word of God, that's how long it's going to be around as it's written in the New Testament. The, the heavens are going to pass away, the earth is going to pass away, but the Word of God will never pass away. Uh, you can engrave it in stone. In fact, is the Word is going to last longer than the stone that you engrave it in because it will last forever and ever. You're never wasting your time when you study the Word of God for that reason. Verse 6, Then shall I not be ashamed, this word quite often translated confused, when I have respect unto all thy commandments. Commandments is the fourth in the list of ten words uh, in Bullinger's Appendix 73. To have respect to something is to uh, regard it with pleasure or to regard it with care. And I know many of you uh, regard God's Word and His commandments with pleasure, with care. Verse 7, I will praise thee with uprightness of heart or mind, you could say, when I shall have learned thy righteous judgments. And here we have two of the ten words, righteous or Righteousness is the eighth in the list of ten words. Judgment is the seventh in ten words. And note, those of you with companion Bibles, you have the Hebrew letter Alif, uh, which is the beginning of this section in front of each Hebrew line. Uh, you'll have that in your companion Bible. And, and every in the Hebrew, now stick with me, in the Hebrew, every line or verse, let's say, for ease of you to understand, begins with the Hebrew letter A. And as we get into the second section, uh, we're going to see that it continues success, successively through the, the Hebrew alphabet. Um, Beth will be the, the section that follows 
the Alif section. Verse 7, I will praise thee. Well, we got that. Let's go with 8. I will keep thy statutes. Oh, forsake me uh, not utterly, not in any wise or in any way. And your Heavenly Father won't forsake you if you don't forsake Him. But it is written that if you uh, forsake Him, He will forsake you or cast you off forever. Now we come to the uh, second section. Again, you have, we have the Hebrew letter uh, Beth or Baith, is however you wish to pronounce it. Uh, but it's the cleansing of the way. And in this, this, this section, we learn how you cleanse your way. And uh, let's go with it. Verse 1. Wherewithal shall a young man, and this word uh, young man here is in, by indication in your Strong's Concordance, meaning your a servant, in other words, of the Lord. Wherewithal or how shall a servant cleanse his way? Question mark. By taking heed thereto according to thy word. How do you cleanse your way? You pay attention to God's word. You try and do things God's way, not your own way. That's, that's where we get off track. And we get off in the ways of the world rather than doing things God's way. If you want to cleanse your way, you, you take heed according to thy word. And the word uh, heed here is shamar. Uh, it means to guard even or hedge about. The, the, and we have here the W-O-R-D to in verse 9 is uh, the, the Hebrew word dabar. And we're going to see a different word in verse 11 for word. But uh, the W-O-R-D to in verse 9 is the tenth in the uh, list of ten words associated with Bullinger's Appendix uh, 73, verse 10. With my whole heart have I sought thee. O oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Don't let me uh, stray or transgress from thy commandments, Lord. And what is to transgress the, the law, the commandments? That's to sin, and, and simple as that. Don't, don't let me get sidetracked, in other words. Uh, let, let my whole heart or my mind that, that it always seek you. And, and every time I hear the word sought or seek in God's word, I can't help but think of First Chronicles chapter 28, verse 9, as, as King David was preparing his son Solomon, who at that time was 19 years old. But David was preparing Solomon to take the throne. And he told Solomon, he said, Seek the Lord, and he will be found of you. But... If you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. Verse 11. Thy word have I hid in mine heart, or my mind, that I might not sin against thee. Now, the word W-O-R-D in this verse is Imra in the Hebrew. And, and it mean, it's actually the word saying would be a better translation, which is the fifth of the ten words listed in Bullinger's Appendix uh, 73. Now, the word hid here, check it out also. We're not to, to take the Word of God and hide it. As we learn in the New Testament, you don't light a candle and, and then put it, hide it under a bed or under a bushel basket. You set it on a candlestick so that the light, the truth, uh, illuminates the whole room, the whole area, if you will. This word hid is, I, I reserved it, or, or in other words, it was so valuable to me, I treasured it, would be a good way to think of this. And again, no one is perfect, but uh, when you come to the knowledge of God's Word, you, you develop uh, your maturity level. and. And you, you develop your spiritual discernment and you're able to tell right from wrong. It becomes intuitive to you to, to know right from wrong and you, you don't want to sin. When you, when you do mess up, 
it's more of an unconscious thing than a conscious thing. And uh, again, don't all, don't get off on a guilt trip. None of us is perfect, and but it does state in what is it Romans chapter six that when you come to knowledge of God in His Word, you go through a form of resurrection where. That's one of the three meanings of the word of resurrection in God's word. You, you're raised to a higher level of thinking, uh, that level of thinking where, again, your conscience tells you when something is right or when something is wrong. And you don't want to do wrong. You don't want to go against your father's will or his word. Verse 12. Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. And you must, of course, be willing to learn his statutes. Uh, and, uh, otherwise, uh, it's a waste of time for him to try and teach you. The word actually becomes an inward motive to those who are mature in the word. In other words, you, you want to do what's right, and, and everything else is, becomes a selfish action on the part of people. And people who are off in the ways of the world, uh, that's all they care about is self. Uh, they can care less about other people uh, for the most part. They have no compassion. All they're, they're interested in is accumulating uh, material things for themselves. But again, God's Word becomes an inward motive, and it, that motive is quite the opposite of selfishness. Verse 13, With my lips have I declared all the judgments of thy mouth. And his judgments are uh, always righteous. They're, they're right and they're fair. He shows uh, no favoritism. Uh, he shows uh, no uh, impartial. He's impartial completely. He doesn't show partiality to one of his children over another. And oftentimes it, it never ceases to amaze me how uh, people shudder, Christians included, when they hear the word judgment, it's like they start shaking in their boots. And that's not, should not be the case. If you love and serve the Lord, you should look forward to judgment. I look forward to Jesus Christ returning at the second advent. And, and straightening this mess out that we have created here in the world. And then also the impending judgment that comes at the end of the millennium. That's payday uh, for those of you who love and serve the Lord. Those of you who take His Word seriously and you make time in your life to study His Word and you're guided by it. Uh, eternal life is the reward. Verse 14. I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies as much as in all riches. Build up your riches in heaven, not here on earth. It's written in Revelation chapter 14, verse 13, that you know the only thing that you can take with you? It's certainly not the riches that you uh, think that you're accumulating forever here on earth. Uh, what you take with you when you die in the flesh you take your works, whether good, bad, or ugly, your works go with you. Verse 15, I will meditate. This word is siach in the Hebrew, and it means the prime root of it is to ponder. Uh, and by implication, it means to converse. I will meditate in thy precepts and have respect unto thy ways. Respect the same word that we had in verse 6, and it means to regard with pleasure or care. Verse 16, I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. Unfortunately, many today cannot say this. Uh, they can't say, I won't forget the word of God because they've never learned the word of God to begin with. They haven't been taught, uh, mostly because they don't have time for God. Uh, we learned in that particular section that God would teach those who are willing to listen. And, and after all, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, 
the, the, the reverence, the fear it states there, but it should have been translated the reverence of the Lord is the beginning of all knowledge, but fools despise instruction. And we have that back in Psalm 107, that fools despise uh, boar, I think was the word, strong meat. Here we have the third section, Gimel, and the Hebrew letter uh, equates to the English letter G uh, for the most part. In, in the, this section with the Hebrew letter Gimel, we see a prayer for strength. Do you ever need a little extra strength? Well, listen up. 17. Deal bountifully with my servant, with thy servant, that I may live and keep thy word. And this word bountifully, check it out, is gamal, a very special word. It means to ripen, uh, such as a, a piece of fruit would ripen. Uh, and it also means to wean, specifically, W-E-A-N. And if you were raised on a farm, you know that to, to wean, let's say a calf, for example, and uh, there comes a point when it, a calf needs to be weaned from his mother, his mama, the mama cow. And that's necessary, so he moves on from the milk and to other foods. And on a spiritual level, it's, and, and the, by the way, to wean a calf from a cow, uh, you know that if you're on the farm, that's a lot of times easier said than done because there's two ways to basically do it. One, separate the mama cow from the baby calf when it's time to get off the milk. But then the other hand, you can take a uh, pronged device and put it on the snout of the calf. And then when the calf tries to nurse the mama, the little prongs poke the mama in the udder and she's gone. So that, that's the, basically the two ways that you wean. But on a spiritual level, uh, we as Christians need to wean ourselves from the milk. Uh, not too long back in our uh, lessons in the Psalms, we went to Hebrews, uh, what was it, I believe chapter 5, where Paul teaches there that, you know, you were supposed to be maturing as Christians. But at a time when you should be knowledgeable enough that you would be able to teach others about God's Word, you are in need of milk yourself. In other words, back to the basics of Christianity, uh, salvation, for example, and you have need of someone to instruct you in the first utterances of God again. Rather than being mature and being onto the meat, uh, you're stuck in the milk. And, that's what happens, unfortunately, in churches today. Uh, you see it time and time again. That, and don't take me wrong, there's nothing wrong with sal salvation. is a beautiful thing. Uh, we need evangelists to bring people to Jesus Christ as Christians. But then, though, once a congregation, and you see it, that people go to church for 30 years, and all they hear from a pastor who's supposed to uh, prepare the pasture, that's God's word for the flock, uh, all they hear is a salvation message. And there's nothing wrong with that uh, as long as there are people who need to be saved hearing it. But if everybody in that congregation has already been saved and they're hearing the same salvation message over and over again, that's wrong. That, that's cheating. The, the pastor is cheating the congregation of getting on to the meat of God's Word. Is that because of laziness on the part of the pastor? Perhaps, uh, perhaps lack of knowledge on the part of the pastor to teach the people. Verse 18, open, this is gala in the Hebrew, to, to reveal, if you will, reveal or open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of the law. And this is a, a great thing to pray for from your heavenly Father. Uh, pray for eyes to see and ears to hear. 
uh, asking for understanding. It, it states in uh, James chapter 1, verse 5, if any of you lack wisdom, ask your Father for it, and He giveth to all abundantly. But uh, don't forget to thank Him if He has given you eyes to see and ears to hear in order that you can understand His Word. Verse 19, I am a stranger in the earth. Hide not thy commandments from me. And a stranger means a foreigner, if you will, a sojourner. And, and Jesus said as much in, in John chapter 17, verse 14. Jesus says, I am not of this world and neither are you of this world. And by that, it doesn't mean that you don't belong here on earth. It simply means that when it comes down to you're doing things God's way, you know what is right and to do things God's way. You're not off in the ways of the world distracted uh, from God's word. Verse 20, my soul, my nephesh in the Hebrew, breaketh for the longing uh, that it hath unto thy judgments at all times. And this word breaketh means that it dissolves, if you will. The longing is a, a fervent desire. And the psalmist is saying here, I long for his return and his judgments, re returning to our, our heavenly Father. Verse 21, Thou hast rebuked the proud, they are cursed, which do err, or they go far astray, from thy commandments. And you know, pride in some respects is a good thing. We should be uh, proud of, of the work we do. And, and I hope you're able to say, I'm proud of the job I do for my boss. As Christians, that's our responsibility, is to perform well for our, our bosses, as it's translated, masters in the New Testament. But on the other hand, there's a pride that is very bad. Uh, when we get off on uh, ego trips, uh, that was Satan's downfall, as it's written in Ezekiel chapter 28, where he's called the king of Tyrus. Uh, God promoted him to, to be a cherub that watches over the mercy seat. Now well, he got all puffed up. That means he got off on an ego trip and wanted to sit on the mercy seat. And as a result of that, they are cursed, as it states in that verse. So uh, you got a choice, beloved. You can uh, be cleansed or you can be cursed. And basically when it comes right down to it, uh, it's not a decision that someone else makes for you. That decision is a decision you make. And you know, on Judgment Day, there's not going to be anybody standing between you and your Heavenly Father. I hope you're able to stand there uh, and be proud of the works that you've done on earth without getting all puffed up in yourself and be cleansed and receive a ticket into the eternity rather than be as those who are proud and all puffed up in themselves and going into the lake of fire with Satan. Uh, we'll come back and work some more on this Psalm 119 in our next lecture. Uh, we've got a short message. We'll ask you to listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Welcome back. We're glad you could join back with us. Let's have the 800 number, please. 800-643-4645. That number good throughout Puerto Rico. 
the U.S. and Canada. If you have a biblical question that you'd like to pose to possibly be answered on the air, feel free to call that 800 number and leave your question. Please don't ask questions about a specific individual, denomination, or organization by name. Uh, we try and teach God's Word in a positive manner, throwing out negative about others by names uh, serves no purpose. We simply won't do it. If you're listening by shortwave radio or studying via the internet and not in a country that's not able to use that 800 number, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Quite all right to mail your questions in being the point. Got a prayer request? We can do away with the telephone number. You don't need a telephone. You don't need paper and pencil and a mailing address. Your Heavenly Father is there for you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I hope you know that he loves you and you know he may or may not love what you're doing but father loves his children he's patient with us he's merciful he wants to forgive so uh, if you think well I really shouldn't talk to him because I've really been doing a lot of bad things that's all the more reason friend that you need to talk with him that's the beauty of Christianity is that you can repent which means to go to your father with with a, a changed heart a changed mind meaning you don't want to mess up you don't want to sin anymore, but then ask for his forgiveness. And he wipes out those sins next to your name in the books, the books that you'll be judged upon, uh, the great white throne judgment of Revelation chapter 20. Got these prayer requests, Father. We ask you to look upon these, Father. We come to you united in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask you to look upon these, Father. You know their needs. If it is your will, a special blessing on these. Uh, we lift up our military troops who are in harm's way around the world, Father, as well. We ask you to watch over, guide, direct, touch, heal in Yeshua Jesus' precious name. Amen and thank you, Father. All right, let's get to some questions and let's see what's up on people's minds. First up today, Sheila, and Sheila's from Virginia. I do understand people do try to blame God for real bad things that go on, like people being killed in church, children being shot and killed in schools. I don't blame God for those things, but I believe God can see things before they happen. Why wouldn't he stop the devil before he acted? So many hearts are broken, homes destroyed. It's things like this I don't understand. I know he does things his way in his time. I don't doubt him at all, but why uh, the people in the church and the little children in the schools? And the answer to your question, Sheila, is because uh, the devil is wicked and those who follow him do wicked and evil things. There are some very, very evil people in the world at this time. Watch the evening news. You know about the, the school shootings and uh, church shootings and the list goes on and on. These, the wicked won't be in the eternity. You can rest assured of that. Uh, Revelation chapter 21 tells us along about verses 4, 5, and 6 that when God's throne comes down uh, to heaven that he's going to wipe away the tears from his children and There'll be no more pain, uh, no more sorrow, no more death. Uh, why? Because Satan and his, the wicked who choose to support him and follow him go into the lake of fire. They are never to be thought of again. Skeet in Georgia. Uh, the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 22, verse 5. Will you tell me what it means? And those of you who aren't familiar, Deuteronomy 22.5 states that a woman should not wear that which pertaineth to a man, and a man should not wear that which pertaineth to a woman. And we're not talking about cross-dressers here. Uh, we're talking about that, and it's a figure of speech. And you have to understand there are figures of speech. Like if I were to say you in English, let's go out tonight and paint the town red. But if we translated that to Japanese and you said that to somebody who just learned English two or three years ago, they wouldn't have a clue what you were talking about. That's because it's a figure of speech. That in Deuteronomy 22.5 is a Hebraism, which means a Hebrew 
figure of speech. It means that a woman should not take a man's place in a sexual intercourse, nor should a man take a woman's place in sexual intercourse. You go on to say, oh, and you wrote here, just write it down, the answer, and put it in on a piece of paper in with the newsletter and mail it to me. Well, we don't provide written responses to everyone that would like. And, and Skeet, you don't understand that when we mail out newsletters here, it's pretty much an automated process. And there are uh, 70,000 newsletters that go out every month, so it would be kind of tough to go through all those and find yours and include a little note. So I hope you heard it on the program, and for those, if you didn't even, the reason I said that is for the benefit of you that are hearing it, please don't ask for a written response to your questions right here verbally on the air is the only way. We simply don't have the time or staff to answer everyone's question in writing who would like it. We would never get around to teaching God's Word and we believe that is the, our commission from God. Barbara in Alabama, first thank you for your teaching, you're welcome, we're glad you enjoy studying. Second, I have a question. Is it really true once saved, always saved? Last but not least, may you and yours have a blessed holiday season, and thank you for that, and the same blessing upon you and your family. No, uh, once saved, always saved doesn't always apply. There's a situation if you are uh, saved and you commit the unforgivable sin, you're doomed. You're, there is no forgiveness. and. Uh, you, you aren't saved anymore after that period of time. Of course, the only ones who can commit that sin are God's elect. And will anyone? I don't believe so. But all will be judged for the sins that are next to our name in the books that will be opened in Revelation chapter 20 at the time of the great white throne judgment. So uh, leave it at that. Bernice in Georgia. Thank you and thank your staff for teaching and great works. And well, God is the one who's great. Thank you, though. I enjoy it so much. I have been studying with you for one year. It's great to study with someone so knowledgeable. Thank you for that. Your question, uh, I heard you say Noah's son slept with his mother. I didn't hear where you said this was located in the Bible. And you'll find that in Genesis uh, chapter 9, verses 21 and 22. And what happened there, the three boys uh, got Noah on a drunk. Uh, he got on a toot. And while that happened, Ham, one of his sons, uncovered his nakedness. Well, what does that mean? Well, that's another figure of speech, if you will, in the Hebrew language. You can read in Leviticus uh, chapter 18, verse 7 and 8. And even, uh, even more plainly, Leviticus chapter 20, verse 11, uh, tells us that to uncover our father's nakedness uh, means to have intercourse with his wife. In this case, it was Ham, and that actually after the laws of incest uh, were given would have been an incestuous relationship. However, the law of incest had not been given at that time. But Ham did uncover his father's nakedness. That means he uh, had intercourse with uh, Noah's wife, who after all was his own mother. And there was a conception, a child resulted. His name was Canaan. And you know, many falsely teach that that's the beginning of the, the, the Afro-American, the black race. That's not you, uh, an incestuous relationship uh, does not change the color of the child's skin. And so that was not the beginning of the, uh, and it's actually, I think, an insult to uh, my black brothers and sisters in Christ that they say that was the beginning of the origin of their race. Uh, blacks and, and African Americans, all other races, were created in Genesis chapter 1, not Genesis chapter 9. And they say that God cursed uh, Canaan. It wasn't God who cursed Canaan. You need to go back and read that again. It was Noah who cursed Canaan. Why? Because he was the result of an incestuous relationship. 
And he sent him away. He didn't want to be reminded of it every day. Edelius in Michigan. I have a hard time understanding the Bible, but I love to study with you. Well, we're glad you do. I have an aneurysm, and I think that is what makes me not understand. Will God hold that against me? I guess he knows my heart, but it is great studying the way you teach. Thank you. Please answer on the air. And you're really, you're very welcome, Edelius. And, and yes, God knows all of our limitations, our disabilities, if you will, our strong points, our weak points. And you hit it right on the head when you said, God knows my heart. And and your heart in, in God's Word in the Old Testament in particular can also be translated your mind. He, he knows your thoughts. He knows you love Him. So, uh, no, He's not going to hold uh, something against you when it's a disability uh, or a shortcoming that's causing it. Josh in Michigan, I have been studying with you for about eight years. I have been injured in two accidents. I smoke medical marijuana and it stops the pain. Am I sinning? Always follow uh, doctor's orders. Um, we never advise people to go against doctor's orders here at the chapel. That's, that's none of our business. That's between you and the medical professionals who are providing your health care. If you're not happy with your health care, then uh, can talk to your, your providers about it or change providers, but uh, we teach God's Word here at the chapel. We don't give medical advice. Dan in New Hampshire, thank you for your consistent teaching. You're welcome. Question, since the autumn of 2012, I continue to see the number 11 everywhere. Is there a word for the believers hidden in the significance of this number? Your thoughts are greatly anticipated and appreciated. Well, in biblical numerics, the number 11, and I don't know how this relates to where you've been seeing it, but in biblical numerics, in God's Word, uh, 11 is judgment and disorder. Next up, Tyler in Texas. What is the book of Jasher, and where would I find that? Well, you'll find the book of Jasher mentioned in God's Word in first time in Joshua uh, chapter 10 uh, verse 13 and I believe there that it's referring uh, the, the word Jasher means just or upright and I think it's referring to there in Joshua 10 13 to the book of Kings uh, which is first and second Samuel and also uh, First and Second Kings. In, in many Bibles, First and Second Samuel are called the First and Second Books of Kings, whereas the Kings are called the Third and Fourth Book of Kings. Also mentioned the Book of Jasher in Second Samuel, uh, chapter one, verse eighteen, and that in connection with a song entitled "The Bow." Is there any other, are there any other studies you have that talk about the catabole? I'm getting Genesis chapter 1 through 6 and the three world ages. Those are both really good studies on the subject that you're asking about. If you have a companion Bible, Tyler, check out Appendix 146 in, in the companion Bible and also Appendix 195. 195 goes into the dispensations and the world ages, but be aware there that Bullinger failed to recognize a first earth and heaven age. And if you add the first and earth, earth and heaven age uh, to his listing in Appendix 195, you, you got it pretty accurate. Felicia in Oklahoma, is it possible that I can anoint members of my family without them being there. In other words, by proxy. Please give me scripture. They have drug problems and the child was taken away from them. Please let me know what I can do. Well, it's not written anywhere, Felicia, but 
we recommend here at the chapel that if you're not able to, uh, and, and many times people don't want to be anointed. They don't think they have a problem, and especially the case of drug addiction or alcoholism, uh, denial is, is the problem, not that they need to be anointed or, or would even think to ask to be. But yes, it's a good thing for you to do. You can, in your faith, you can go to the Lord and be anointed in proxy for them. And that's a very loving uh, thing to do. Uh, that's a compassionate thing to do. And especially when children are involved, I know your heart must be breaking uh, for the child. But not, it's quite all right. And we do recommend here at the chapel that in many cases, that's the best thing that you can do is be anointed in proxy uh, for the pe people or persons that you, you have a, know have a need. Cassidy in Texas, what are your thoughts on homosexuality? Do you think it is an abomination? Well, my thoughts really don't amount to much. Uh, it's what God's Word says that is important and that, that everyone should be concerned about. And God makes it very clear in His Word. Leviticus uh, chapter 18, verse 22, that uh, where God stands on homosexuality, uh, it is an abomination. That's not the only place in his word that it states it's an abomination, but uh, if you want one, Leviticus chapter 18, verse 22. Darlene in Missouri, my whole family has stolen from me my whole life. I have a lot of hate towards them how do I get over this? Well, make a note, Darlene, of 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 3, uh, verse 6, and the following verses. And it tells us how to deal uh, with friends and family who don't do things according to God's Word. That's 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6, and the following verses. Matt in Virginia. Where was the description of Jesus Christ and the physical appearance of Jesus example page that you all offer at the chapel historically taken from? And again, it's historical. I want to make sure that's clear. This is not uh, taken from God's Word in a biblical sense, but there is a letter that Pontius Pilate uh, wrote to the Roman officials after uh, his uh, relations with Christ prior to the crucifixion. And in that, that's a description of the appearance of Jesus. And uh, we make that available if you're ordering uh, something and request it, just ask for it. If you're not ordering or sending a donation, send a self-addressed stamped envelope and request Pontius Pilate's description of Jesus Christ, and we'll be happy to pass that along to you. Jay in California, how can the companion Bible text be that of the 1611 King James authorized version if it isn't written in Old English? Well, you, you answered your own question because it's the authorized version. It's a later uh, translation in a more modern English is spoken, although some people complain that they can't deal with the these and the thous and the thys in the King James Version Bible, but uh, they haven't seen the 1611 Bible as you have evidently, but it is the authorized vision that the Bible I teach from is not written in Old English, but it is an authorized King James Version 1611 Bible. My question, who do we have here? Teresa from Arkansas. My question is this. <clears throat> Where were there two Sauls in the Bible? King Saul is described as being tall and large. The other Saul, later known as Paul, was described as small in stature. The Smith's Dictionary uh, describes Paul and Saul both as Benjamites. Please help me. God bless you. Uh, you missed one Saul. Uh, you read about him in Genesis <clears throat> chapter 36, verse 37. He was a, one of the kings of Edom. But the two you're talking about both were Benjamites. Of course, 
Uh, Saul was the son of Kish, I believe it was, uh, who was a Benjamite in 1 Samuel chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. The fact that Saul, who God struck down on the road to Damascus and later changed his name to Saul, uh, excuse me, Paul, uh, you can read about in Romans chapter 11, verse 1. Paul makes it very clear he was a Benjamite. Cheryl and Organ. Is the author E.W. Bullinger the same person who translates Hebrew or Greek scripture? Cheryl Bullinger was a, a fantastic uh, scholar of both Hebrew and Greek. In fact, he is the only uh, Christian uh, translator that Goodspeed uh, trusted to proofread uh, his works. Quite an honor. Uh, Brigham in Nebraska. Brigham is eight years old. I am writing this on behalf of my eight-year-old nephew, Brigham. Evidently, he had seen a movie on TV about a plane crash in the Andes Mountains, and the survivors stayed alive by eating the flesh of those who had died in the crash. He asked me if God had a law against eating people and if those people would get sent to hell. All I could tell him was about the food laws, but told him if I, he wanted, I would ask you. He'll be watching Shepherd's Chapel after school, and he would really get excited to get his question answered on the air. I hope Brigham is watching 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 29. It actually happened in the time of Jehoram, king of Israel. The people got down to eating. But in Leviticus 26, that was the fourth level of God's chastisement. You can either have lots to eat or you'll be eating your own children if you walk contrary to God. Way out of time. I love you all because you enjoy studying God's Word in depth. He, he makes his day when he sees you studying as well. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you and to reach out to others as well. One thing that's most important though, beloved, and it's this, you stay in his word every day. Every day in your father's word is a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why? Because Jesus is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.